This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to talk a little bit about how the U.S. dollar dies. And we're going to be taking a somewhat roundabout path, but I promise you that if you stick with this video, you're going to learn a lot, and it's going to be worth it in terms of getting the big picture about the U.S. dollar and how we're going to transition away from a U.S. dollar standard. So I'm going to begin with a question from Paul, 1887. Here's a dumb question for you. Why do governments buy bonds issued by other governments? Why does Japan even own U.S. bonds? Isn't that sort of like buying stock in a competing company? So I think this is a good question. We're going to start by answering it by looking at what are called trade deficits. So basically, the U.S. exports goods and services to Japan, and the U.S. also imports goods and services from Japan. And we can use these to calculate a trade deficit. So in 2021, the U.S. exported $75 billion worth of goods and services to Japan, and it imported approximately $135 billion. And so we can say, if we just subtract these two, that the U.S. has a trade deficit with Japan of $60 billion, $60.1 billion exactly. And by, by contrast, or the inverse of that, is that Japan has a trade surplus with the U.S. It's obviously the same number. It's just a question of it being a, a positive or negative sign. So what should Japan do with that extra $60 billion dollars worth. It has a few options. It could sell those U.S. dollars for yen and thus strengthen the yen and weaken the dollar, but this wouldn't be good for exports, so this is normally not what's what's done. It can also take those U.S. dollars, Japan can take those U.S. dollars and buy U.S. assets like U.S. stocks, U.S. real estate. If a country does this too much, it can make the host country a little bit nervous when I was in high school, there was all this talk about Japan taking over the world, especially when Japan bought 51% of the Rockefeller Center in New York City. So when some, one country starts to take over, and at this point, Japan was also buying a lot of California real estate, for example. Again, what happened then is in the early 90s, the whole bubble burst in, J in Japan, and this wasn't a concern. But if you do recycle your trade surpluses into buying another country's real estate, it can create some political and uh, political tensions. So what Japan can also take, we talked about how they can buy real estate with it, they can buy US stocks, but they could also take that trade surplus of $60 billion and buy US treasuries, which are US government bonds that the US treasury issues to fund US government operations. So if a country takes a trade surplus and invests it in that trade partners government bonds, this is called recycling the trade surplus. There are a couple other word names for it, but that's the main way you hear it referred to. And this is the main reason that a country will own another country's bonds, simply because they're recycling a trade surplus back into that country's bonds and trying to keep the money in the same currency, especially when that currency happens to be the global reserve currency, as is true for the U.S. dollar. Now, something similar happens with oil producers as well. Saudi sells U.S. oil for U.S. dollars because this was part of the early 1970s agreement where commodity trade, especially crude oil trade, would be conducted using U.S. dollars. And this was a way of transitioning away from a gold standard for the U.S. and giving people a reason to hold a lot of dollars. They had to hold dollars because you could only buy oil denominated in U.S. dollars. So Saudi takes U.S. US um, t sells the U.S. oil, gets U.S. dollars, takes those U.S. dollars and buys U.S. stocks, U.S. real estate, U.S. treasuries, basically recycling. You may have heard this term petrodollars, recycling petrodollars back into the U.S. Now, why might both of these things be a good deal for the U.S., recycling a trade surplus and recycling petrodollars into the U.S.? Well, foreign buying of U.S. treasuries helps to keep interest rates lower in the U.S. The price of the bond goes up when a lot of people buy treasuries, and this makes the interest rate go down because these two things move inversely to one another, as we spoke about yesterday. Lower interest rates are obviously good for consumer borrowing for the stock market, for the real estate market, because you're dealing with a lower discount rate for all these assets and their future cash flows. And if interest rates are low and U.S. consumers can borrow a lot of money, which is something they seem to like to do, happy and wealthy U.S. consumers, or at least consumers who are willing to go into a lot of debt, benefit, benefit from low interest rates and in turn buy more stuff from Japan and concern, consume more oil from Saudi. So this is the ultimate recycling loop here where those lower interest rates keep the U.S. consumer going or at least have for the last couple of decades and enable them to buy more stuff from Japan, buy more stuff from Saudi, and then re those countries will recycle the money back into U.S. treasuries. And you have a bit of a virtuous circle that is at least until it stops. Now, the only quote unquote minor problem with this is 
is that this has absolutely gutted the U.S. manufacturing sector, really since 1971, and destroyed the working class and the middle class to a huge extent. It's led to the opiate crisis, etc., as people despair, seeing their towns emptied out of jobs. But this outsourcing, as we've discussed many times on this channel, has been quite good for elites who own a lot of stocks and real estate. But what we dis discovered during the pandemic is the national security risk associated with this. Do we really want to be dependent on other countries, especially China, for key medical supplies, for defense components, etc.? So the pandemic helped to highlight these supply chain risks. And this itself is a really good argument for reshoring things. And people were making this argument before the pandemic, but obviously now it's much more clear that it makes sense to reshore many things like drug manufacturing, semiconductors, et cetera, back to the US. And this is good for the working class and good for the middle class as well. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I just ask you to hit that like and subscribe buttons. I will link to this BIS document that I got the, the trade data from the US exports of Japan and the imports from Japan. So you can dig down into that if you're interested. So to summarize so far, any country can take its US dollar trade surplus and convert it back into its own domestic currency by real estate stocks, private companies, corporate bonds, mortgages, mortgage-backed securities in the US, for example, wherever it's trading with, and also by the government bonds of that country, in this case, US treasuries. But then we come to the problem of money printing. What if the US is printing a lot of money and devaluing those US dollars so much that the US treasuries no longer provide a fairly stable store of value? If inflation is at seven or eight percent or much higher, which it probably is, and you're getting a yield of four or five percent on your treasuries, you're losing money every single year and it's not really a stable store of value. And this is something China really began to wake up after the US started quantitative easing in 2009, as we're going to see. In this case, a country like Japan or China may wish to take that trade surplus dollars and buy other things that are denominated in US dollars, like physical gold, crude oil, gold mines, crude oil in the ground, in other words, uh, wells and other production fields, copper mines, etc. You get the idea. When this happens, a key buyer of US treasuries like China disappears on the margin and someone else needs to buy those US treasuries to fund the US government because, it, because the US government very rarely shrinks the amount of treasuries they're issuing. They did this during Clinton's administration in, in the late 90s, but that was really the last time. What happens is they need to roll these treasury bonds and there needs to be a buyer of it. And if Japan and China aren't there in the margin, someone else needs to buy those treasuries. The US, US retail investor, to an, to an extent, and right now people are tempted by three, four, or 5% yields on treasuries, or the Federal Reserve, who's the ultimate, the buyer of last resort. But this is especially a problem, as we said, when the Fed says that it's doing quantitative tightening, shrinking its balance sheet, and not buying any more US treasuries. So you have a key problem when the Fed stops buying, and also these foreign buyers of treasuries like Japan and China scale back their buying at the same time. Now, US treasuries are still the main global reserve asset. This is what central banks and countries hold to settle their trade surpluses in, as we've been looking at. These US treasuries are denominated in US dollars, obviously, which is the global reserve currency. So you have treasuries as the global reserve asset, US dollars as the global reserve currency, the main currency that's still used for global trade. Now, US treasuries are held mostly by countries and their central banks as a way of settling, as we said, trade surpluses with the US. But what happens if you start to weaponize US treasuries? When you freeze US dollars and US treasuries held by Russia, Iran, Libya, Iraq, etc., it definitely makes countries like China get a little bit worried and wondering what's going to happen to them if the US decides to do something with their treasuries that they're holding. And ultimately, it pushes them, in other words, China, into other settlement assets like gold, and ultimately, I believe, into Bitcoin. Now, this is bad for US hegemony, but good for global fairness. If you think about it, it's really weird to have a single country's government bonds at the heart of a global financial system. And this is really what was set up post-1971 and really post Bretton Woods after World War II, having the US at the center. US used to be on a gold standard, but either way, everyone was pegging their, their currencies to the US dollar. And this is kind of a silly way of doing things. People like Keynes warned against it. And this was one of the few times that Keynes was actually right about something. The problem is it ultimately leads to instability. 
as well as that country weaponizing its bonds as the U.S. has done and weaponizing its currency at the expense of allies and enemies alike and becoming a bit of a global bully. Again, if you have the global reserve currency, this was true when, when the U.K. had it, this was true when Portugal and Spain had it, you have to project military power abroad and this creates a lot of resentment as well. It's sort of inevitable though if you're guaranteeing the trade channels that you're issuing the global reserve currency, but it ultimately leads to instability and it gives the US this unfair advantage of being able to bully bully people with uh, by threatening to turn off treasuries and, and, and freeze their US dollars. US, the gold standard was actually a much better system than that, uh, apart from the fact that gold is difficult to transport and to say at large scale, and it ultimately leads to a system based on trust. So this is what the, the, the Bretton Woods system was really like. Trust me, every U.S. dollar is backed by gold. And it turns out it wasn't because the U.S. ended up printing more dollars than they had gold to back it. This is why Bitcoin is better because Bitcoin is easier to transport and to say, verify. It's the, really the best candidate for a new global sound money standard. And it's my belief that Bitcoin will end up being the new global reserve asset replacing U.S. treasuries. As we've talked about many, many times on this channel, Bitcoin is neutral money. It's not issued by a corporation. It's not issued by a single government like the U.S. government. Bitcoin is scarce and no one, not the U.S., not China, not Russia, can print more of it unfairly. You need to either exchange fiat for it or you need to do the work, the proof of work, and do Bitcoin mining. Postscript, crypto backed by gold, as some of you might suggest at this point in the video, is not the solution simply because this reintroduces the problem of trust. Someone needs to custody that gold or whatever's backing the currency and then perform currency uh, conversions back and forth between that crypto and whatever the underlying asset is. So I'll link to this video if you want to explore that more. Should Bitcoin be backed by something? And I conclude that if you back a currency by something, it creates a, it gives unfair power to the custodian of whatever's backing that currency. So what might be the writing on the wall for the US dollar now that we've seen this, this context? The first example would be major holders of US treasuries beginning to shrink their holdings. And that's definitely what we've seen. Japan, since November of 2021, has shrunk their holdings of US treasuries from 1.3 trillion to a little under 1.1 trillion. China has, has uh, shrunk their holdings of US treasuries from 1.08 trillion down to 870 billion. And so we're beginning to see this. This is a reversal of a trend in the other direction for many, many years. What other writing on the wall for the U.S. dollar? We, we might begin to see oil priced in currencies other than U.S. dollars. We talked about how the petrodollar was really the basis for the U.S. dollar after the end of the gold standard in uh, when Nixon closed the gold window in 1971. Beginning to see U.S. beginning to see crude oil priced in currencies other than U.S. dollars. This is definitely what we're seeing. We're seeing China and Russia actually trade oil for yuan, and this is um, this is not what you want to see if you want to maintain U.S. dollar hegemony. More writing on the wall for the U.S. dollar. The U.S. begins to reshore key manufacturing, and we talked about this makes a lot of sense from a national security perspective. The more something is sourced and assembled in the U.S the less it obviously contributes to a trade deficit. So there are the fewer of those US dollars abroad that need to be recycled back into treasuries. We've seen a lot of this over the last couple of years, Intel breaking ground on a $20 billion chip plant in Ohio, for example. More writing on the wall, countries working together to create their own basket of currencies for a trade, for trade and to hold as a reserve asset. We're seeing this with some of the BRICS countries. Uh, this is an article from October of 2022. The BRICS countries are working on establishing a new reserve currency to better serve their economic interests. According to Pavel Kanaz uh, Zef, Deputy Director of the Russian Foreign Ministry's Foreign Policy Planning Department, and here's the important part, the new currency will, will be based on a basket of the currencies of the, of the five-nation bloc, the renminbi, the yuan, the ruble, the rupee, the Brazilian real, and the South African rand. Now, it remains to be seen whether this is actually, uh, this basket of currencies becomes a new um, or it's a new currency that's backed by a basket of fiat currencies, how, whether this really takes off or whether these countries, for example, prefer to settle, settle their trade surpluses in something like gold or Bitcoin or, or even remain on U.S. dollars. And only time will tell. But this is another sign of writing on the wall when you have major economies like this looking to do trade using another uh, medium of exchange. So how to play this? Look for more trade surpluses, as we said, to be settled in gold and physical gold. Unfortunately, physical gold is still very bulky. 
and unwieldy. This is one reason I don't own it. I don't think it's the, the reserve asset of the 21st century, but there are going to be countries who are going to like it and are going to treat it as a reserve asset. Also, when you pay for your imports using gold, you open yourself up to this problem of transporting the gold back and forth between the two countries. And someone it's very easy for someone to seize the train or the plane or the boat that has the gold on it. And what you end up doing is just trusting them that they, they have the gold somewhere in a warehouse and they issue certificates against it. And then you're back to uh, the gold standard, which can be cheated on and which doesn't work very well because ultimately there'll be more pieces of paper saying that there's gold than there is gold backing them. Bitcoin is, by contrast, a much better form of money than gold. Gold was the best thing we had. Physical gold as a bearer asset was the best thing we had until 2009 when Bitcoin came on the scene. Bitcoin is more scarce than gold. It's more easy. It's easier to transport. It's easier to say or to verify that it's real. You can do it cryptographically. You don't need to do expensive chemical tests. It's easier to store and hide. You can hide it in a brain wallet, for example, and walk across the border with $10 billion in your head. So this is a race that Bitcoin definitely wins, just a question of how long it takes and the path that it takes. So what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that the US dollar is dying. We've seen all these signs of writing on the wall as various countries move away from US dollars as a medium of exchange and also US treasuries as a global reserve asset. US dollars dying, but this is obviously going to be a long process. This is not something I expect to happen overnight or even over five years, more on the decade level. And in the meantime, many other fiat currencies are going to blow up and die before the U.S. dollar, as we've seen with the Lebanese pound, for example. As the U.S. dollar dies, expect lots of geopolitical chaos and financial stability as the world transitions to something else. And this is not something that any of us have really seen in our lifetimes. Some people who are older saw this transition away from a gold standard in 1971. But this is really something that we haven't seen before, at least on a global scale like this. And as such, it's a little hard to know what to expect. And we have to be careful about applying previous ways of understanding the world to this because we've had this regime really since 1971, the, the fiat regime, and it's now breaking apart and changing and remains to be seen what emerges. I think the world transitions to a Bitcoin standard, as I've argued on this channel. And as I've argued in this video, Bitcoin has all these advantages over physical gold as a bearer asset. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.